First question, first real question is at the back. Uh, this is Stuart McClendon from the Law School. Um, I look at this largely from a, a, a competition as, um, perspective on the telecoms um, side, but on this side I find myself asking the same question, which is who are the actual beneficiaries of the digital single market agenda in this respect? Because, I mean, is it the consumers? Um, is it the rights holders, or is this another example of the Commission viewing a single market as being a, a priori good? So Stuart McLennan asks us, uh, who are the beneficiaries of the digital single market? Uh, consumers, producers, or is it um, the Commission's view that it's a good in its own right? Who wants to take this? This sounds like a Felice question. Yeah. <laughs> This is a good question. I mean, as things are now, without a digital single market, we have a fragmented market. So companies have the possibility both to do content versioning, but also to uh, do price discrimination. Price discrimination is not uh, per se negative, because I mean, it can be an efficient way of uh, providing content, especially when you have a market with uh, a huge difference in uh, purchasing power. Uh, still, I mean, uh, there is room in price discrimination, you know, to uh, move some consumer surplus to the producer uh, surplus. Uh, who are the beneficiaries? As I mentioned before, I think that consumer can be the beneficiaries, especially because, I mean, if you have a need and the market, the market is not able to provide what you need, this is a clear problem to improve uh, the surplus of consumers. And I think that uh, with uh, some time to adjust, also service provider can be beneficiaries because they will be able, you know, to probably uh, uh, achieve a largest uh, audience. And uh, and in this respect, I mean, it's important to understand also the way contract work. So I mean, I don't have a, a, a conclusive as well. Also, I told you they can be beneficiary if they are able to make more money to work from a broader market. Okay. Uh yeah, I want to just to add, there is the risk that the digital single market becomes a sort of policy goal beneficial just to the big uh, enterprises, to the multinational uh, content industry, or in general to the multinational. If you, we think, for instance, of the, the telecom sector, uh, in which there are very, very few uh, um, providers of services that are able to cover the, the entire uh, European Union, Vodafone, Telefonica, and a few, and a few more. Uh, obviously here the digital single market should shape, in my view, in a way that even the medium and small side uh, content uh, authors and producers can benefit from this expanded market. As Felicia said, the issue is not at this time to protect the territoriality in a, let me use this term, in a stupid way, because at the end of the day territoriality is overcome anyway. Religion mentioned the issue of virtual private networks. If you want to access this content, if you want to fictitiously appear in, 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 in Ireland, you, you can. If the possibility exists from a technological perspective, maybe it's not uh, easily available for m my, my dad, who is not familiar with APN, but certainly for the young generations. We have to cope with that. And we have to struggle in order to give right holders the possibility of making more money. Because the, re the reason why they are so angry and so frustrated is that because they have not taken advantage, not fully at least, of the, of the digital environment as such. Okay, next question. Sorry, Eleonora, do you want uh, to...? Uh, um, I just wanted to, you know, um, add a small uh, remark. Uh, this job blocking uh, you know, intervention, uh, uh, it is uncertain whether it will actually go through but certainly, you know, tackling job blocking, I would say that you know, instinctively the primary beneficiaries would be consumers who would have access to content on a, you know, without territorial restrictions. However, um, what might be you know, the practical implications of this? That if you tell me that you're no longer able to license your content uh, on a territorial basis, this means that if you want to get a license, it must be a you know, pan-European license. So it is likely that these licenses will be more expensive than other possibilities currently existing. And you know, these uh, you know, higher price of licenses then <coughs> will be borne by whom? By the right holders, by the licensees, or the end users of the services and the content that they are trying to access, 
So I think that one possible side effect of this might be that the consumers thought to be the initial beneficiaries of this kind of intervention might bear the cost of it. So it remains to be seen in some way. Okay. Uh, I, I, now, I can now ask another question, yes, at the back, please. Hi, uh, my name is David Cavanagh. Uh, there is a serious difficulty with the concept of uh, content being applied to cover the whole range of what is produced as copyright tools. What tends to happen is we tend to, to use the word content uh, and to measure cultural property in terabytes rather than in cultural value. <coughs> And the essence, surely, of each separate item of copyright protected or author's right protected work in the European Union is that each one is of its essence, original and creative, and different from every other one. Each one is specifically designed to appeal to a particular audience. There is not a 500 million person audience for each object of copyright creation, because each one is aimed at a specific audience. Let me quote the example of the Irish soap opera, Fair City, which attracts 500,000 viewers every night. That's to say, five times more Irish people tune in to watch it every night than go to the Abbey Theatre in an entire year. Nonetheless, that soap is unsaleable outside Ireland. Nobody else wants to watch it. Um, are we, the marketplace that's conceived does not exist. And it doesn't exist because of the precise nature of what copyright is. It's cultural production. Uh, so David Kavanagh has argued that uh, uh, individual copyright creative uh, cultural works uh, tend to be uh, very specific in their marketplace, uh, very specific in their consumption, and therefore uh, that undercuts the very concept of the EU digital single market and copyright. Um, anybody? I, th I think it's this, all three of you again. So just um, first. Yeah, um, I am sympathetic to this argument and in, in the afternoon uh, um, there will be a panel uh, discussing the, 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 the issue, which is you know, a big issue of remuneration. How to ensure a fair remuneration for creators uh, in the digital environment, because there are so many complaints about how little is earned by the creators, the individual creators, the writers, the composers in the digital environment. Well, um, here we have to agree on, 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 uh, on whether or not we consider Europe more than uh, a, an aggregation of state or something which is just uh, 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 useful and uh, uh, economic or business related. As I said, Europeans are changing. The fact that we are here, we are Italians, I, I hold that position here at Trinity College would not have been possible 20 years ago. Okay. So, do we expect the people to change also in, in order to be able, while being Italian, speaking Spanish and reading a, a novel in, 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 in English or not? Are, do we have the ambition to become a federal, and I know these, these days it might seem like utopian, but this is a basic question that we have to be able to answer. I'm, I'm very, I disagree strongly with all those who think that the territorial barriers will will be persisting and will uh, uh, um, you know, exclude us from enjoying content. I think that we have to grow. The question is whether or not, I completely agree with the fact that when we talk about copyright, we talk, uh, we talk about culture. I, I believe that at the moment culture is not adequately taken into consideration, but this should not be an excuse for not making a significant progress in accessing uh, culture online. My comment is just that uh, you know I agree with uh, with your concerns, uh, and uh, certainly, you no. Know, if we speak uh, of cultural content, uh, I mean the audiovisual content uh, is uh, you know uh, is bound in a particular fashion to certain linguistic and cultural realities. Uh, no, for music, uh, uh, since you know there is a dom dominating. Uh, role of uh, English speaking, uh, you know, music, mm. etc. But nonetheless, you know, th there are still significant uh, um, uh, realities in which there is, uh, you know, uh, music done in that in a language that is spoken by a few people. Uh, for instance, if we take uh, the Swedish music scene, which apparently is uh, the most thriving in Europe, no, 
It is true that uh, they, uh, the, there are you know, um, subjects like Avicii who produce music in English, but there are also people who make music in Swedish. Now, is there an interest for Swedish songs outside the Sweden or Scandinavia in general? So I would say that uh, this might be something to be taken into account as well. Uh, fortunately, there are studies available. Uh, there, is, uh, there is also an agency uh, in Seville of the European Commission, the Institute for Perspective Technological Studies, that recently measured. We did it as well uh, um, on commission of the Parliament in 2009, and there is a recent study of 2015 uh, published by this uh, commission agency, which is showing what you're saying. In the music sector, this kind of uh, international and cross-border access is a reality, as you said, because of the success, because of the dominance of the Anglo-American repertoire, but also because of the uh, intrinsic feature of music. Music is more easily enjoyable uh, because you, you, even though you don't speak English fluently, you can enjoy easily uh, a, a song uh, in, in, in English. But it's actually changing also the, the, the access to audiovisual works. If you consider the legal market, if you consider how much uh, TV series and films from the US are sold online, then in Ireland I understand that this is not considered a, a pressing issue because you know you don't suffer very much from this kind of online exclusion, to be very frank with you. Because you have, you have had Netflix since 2008 and Felicia told you that that's one of the biggest markets in Europe like Italy started having Netflix in October 2015. So I understand that here the issue might not be perceived as so uh, heavy, but I can assure you that from a Europe, European perspective, uh, Felicia mentioned countries like Bulgaria and Romania where these services are not yet available. So uh, put yourself in the shoes of these Europeans as well. Felicia? I may add, I, I believe that the uh, uh, digital single market can be a true opportunity for uh, uh, small uh, content provider for uh, producers of content that are very local. Um, there is the so-called long tail effect. Basically, if you are a small producer, probably you are not able to, you know, uh, mm, sign a license with, you know, a, a, a provider abroad. So you have a uh, your content goes only your national market. If there are uh, people that speaks your language or likes your content abroad. Uh, having the possibility you know, to access to the content also from other market would in, in, indeed increase the demand for your content and so probably also the price that you are able to make with your, your license. I was very surprised that um, in, in a, um, I, I talked with someone from uh, uh, the Swedish minority in Finland and basically uh, there are several uh, thousands of people uh, in, uh, in Finland that uh, you know, would like to access to to pay for content from Sweden, so you know, to increase the revenues of the Swedish producer, and they cannot just because they are in another member state that, uh, and there is this job blocking issue. So, uh, digital single market does not mean that the minority will be wiped out or you know, small producer will not have any, any chance to, to go online. And this trend is also registered, for instance, when you see to upload a video on YouTube. There are many. Uh, content providers, no one that uh, have a, a broad market in Europe just because they go on YouTube and they go in 28 member states in just one shot. Okay, next question here at the, the front. Thank you, Solicitor. Just in relation to, to the, 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 the sort of the permissibility of blocking and territoriality and setting barriers and limiting Free, trans free circulation of information and limiting content accessibility. Uh, I don't think it's just the word geo-blocking, because I think you have content blocking problems too, and that puts up barriers to freedom of movement of information. And I'm talking if content uh, freedom to publish creates money. And the concept of follow the money is something that the European community favors. And uh, the concept of free trade is very important. So if you block content, if you limit content, for example, you prohibit advertising, then you're limiting income. And you're limiting free trade and the freedom to make money. What are the speaker's comments on that? And then one further point, I just wasn't sure 
Um, Eleonora mentioned a, a concept at the start of her presentation called orphan works without any further explanation. I was wondering what that means. Okay, we have two <laughs> questions. Um, uh, Duncan Crahan Solicitor asks uh, Eleonora to clarify orphan works and then more generally about content blocking uh, having an impact on the freedom to make money. So I'll throw it over, over to uh, Eleonora for both of those questions and then uh, my other two colleagues as well if they want to take them up. Eleonora. First of all, apologies for not uh, clarifying the notion of orphan works. It's a misleading term. It doesn't mean that they are works without parents. They actually have them, so they're not orphans. There are works for which uh, it is not possible to track down who owns the rights to them. So basically, if you want to use these works, uh, you cannot get a license. So you have either two choices. First, you decide not to use them, or you use them at your own peril. No? And, um, for instance, uh, some data, uh, the British Library estimated that 40% of works in its collections are subject to open work status, and the BBC said that uh, in its archives it has over one million hours of footage that is not used because uh, of an uncertain uh, rights status. And so, you know, the um, European Union introduced a directive to allow uh, certain uh, public interest uh, institutions to use these works, uh, and uh, so without uh, the, the need to obtain a permission, it did so by introducing exceptions. And then, uh, in the, uh, a few months ago, the UK introduced a licensing scheme, so you can go and get a license to, do, to use these works. And what happens is, uh, if uh, the right holders show up at a later stage, then the orphan work status uh, is lost, uh, and uh, the treatment is the same of uh, those of other uh, copyright works. Does this answer your question? Thank you. When it comes to the issue of blocking content, the whole, I mean, I think all presentations were uh, uh, critical of, of, of that. I agree with you that these are significant uh, limitation of the freedom to do business to make money you know that online sometimes the deliver sometimes very often the delivery the delivery of content is remunerated through um, advertising no? through ad ad advertising revenue the freemium model you give free access uh, in exchange for you know the tolerance of uh, ads and you you give access to premium content when the content comes just uh, unrestricted and free and, and you know advertising free but again, I think that without the without removing or reducing significantly the uh, the principle of territoriality in Europe, we will never manage to 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 remove that restriction. Geo blocking is just a technical result of something that comes from the law and from the fact that the member states do not want to lose their discretion in setting out the conditions of access to copyright works. In a way, in my view, that is short sighted. And it's actually harming the whole concept of copyright because, as we have said, access to content can occur anyway in an illegal way. So if you do not make copyright effective in terms of, as you said, remuneration opportunities, then the, the concept l loses importance and value. And so the risk is that of keeping territoriality, like in a sanctuary, but then copyright becomes even more effective even less effective, excuse me. 